hold and today I'm going to be talking about um, yeah, investigating the importance of little penguins in the diet of long-nosed fur seals. Um, there. So um, essentially between the 17th and 19th century, um, uncontrolled commercial harvesting had um, some pretty big impacts on um, seal declines within um, Australia. Uh, on Kangaroo Island, for example, um, approximately 100,000 fur seals were um, killed for their pelts between 18, um, at the 1800s and 1830. Um, so following um, relatively low numbers for 150 years, we've actually now seen that the trends in pup production have more than trebled since the 1980s. And um, you can see that here um, in this graph uh, showing the um, trends in pup production for Cape Ganfim and Cape Takuti, the two main breeding colonies on Kangaroo Island, and how they've gone from the three to 400 mark up to just under 4,000 and just over 5,000 um, up to 2013. So with these recent recoveries, there's obviously been a lot of concern about the impact that these um, fur seals may be having on um, little penguin populations and um, commercially, commercial fisheries. Um, I guess a good example of that would be Granite Island, um, which has severe, suffered some really severe declines. Um, so it's really important for us to understand what they, what they are eating and sort of what's happening. Um, in terms of previous studies, um, most dietary studies within South Australia have predominantly um, focused on breeding colonies, so um, within Kangaroo Island and Neptune Islands. And the findings from these studies show that uh, the key prey species for lactating females, or adult females I should say, are omistrepid squid, red bait and mctophids. Um, for those of you who don't know, mctophids are lanternfish that are found in oceanic waters. And comparatively for adult males, um, the key prey species were little penguins, omistrepid squids and red baits. Um, but where one of our big knowledge gap lays is with um, haul-out sites. So haul-out sites are generally just sites where breeding isn't occurring and they're predominantly made up of sub-adult males and juveniles. And it's this portion of the population um, that is uh, predicted to be more relevant in understanding um, the role of fur seals in, in coastal and shelf ecosystems. So the aims of this study are to identify the prey taxa that are consumed by long-nosed fur seals in um, South Australian waters, uh, to identify if there's any spatial variability in their diet, um, to compare the dietary profiles between breeding and haul-out sites, and to identify the importance of commercially fish species and little penguins in long-nosed fur seal diet. So in total, 326 scats were collected um, between July and August in 2014 across three regions, um, Kangaroo Island, the Fleury Peninsula and the York Peninsula. In total, there were 11 sites, um, two of which were breeding colonies, so Cape Takuti and Cape Ganthium, and the remaining sites were haul-outs. So in terms of methods, um, I collected lots of scats and um, then they were placed in snap lock bags and then um, placed in a freezer at minus 20 degrees Celsius. Um, then for actual analysis, uh, they were pre-soaked in hot soapy water for 24 hours and then washed over nested sieves um, where I then would extract hard parts. So things like odlets, which is the ear bone of a fish, um, cephalopod eye, eyeballs, um, penguin feathers, um, all sorts of bits and pieces to kind of start putting the puzzle together. So these hard parts were then grouped into three prey categories, uh, fish, cephalopod and seabird, and the occurrence of the different prey categories in the samples were assessed regionally and by site, um, looking at frequency of occurrence, so what proportion of um, scats contain prey taxa. So from that initial 326 scats, 220 were selected at random, so 20 per each site, um, for further hard part analysis. And so that meant that taking odoliths, pairing them, same with cephalopod beaks, so that's um, like squids, octopi, um, upper and lower beaks, and pairing them and identifying them down to the lowest taxonomic level possible. And then three standard measures were used to look at um, the occurrence of these prey taxa, so numerical abundance, relative occurrence, and biomass. Um, and in biomass, essentially, um, you're able to figure out how much each individual weighs by taking the length of an otolith or the length of um, the hood length of a cephalopod beak 
placing that into a biomass regression equation, and then that gives you the estimated weight of that individual. So for the biomass summaries I'm showing today, I did not include penguins in those summaries, um, simply because we're still struggling to understand um, how long it takes a fur seal to digest a penguin and, and, and how that translates into diet. I guess one of the big issues here was if I had a scat with one penguin feather in it, would I allocate 1.3 kilograms of diet biomass um, to a penguin when I've got one feather of it? But I'll go into that a little bit later. So in terms of numerical abundance, um, dumpling squid mctophid species 1, garfish and sardines were numerically the most abundant species. Um, in terms of what species contributed most to biomass, it was leather jackets, calamari, cuttlefish and garfish. Um, it was clear that there was a, a, a variation regionally in terms of dietary composition. Flurio Peninsula had a much higher um, proportion of cephalopods and um, birds in their diet compared to Kangaroo Island and York Peninsula. Uh, when comparing breeding sites to haulouts, we found that um, there was a higher um, occurrence of oceanic prey species um, at breeding sites compared to haulouts where there was a higher relative proportion of shelf water prey species. And um, in terms of commercially fish species, uh, they represented 19% of the fur seal prey taxa. And in terms of biomass, they contributed 19.4% to um, diet. And that ranged from 0.4% with the anchovies right through to 10.1% with calamari. Um, in terms of penguins, uh, the occurrence of penguin remains varied uh, regionally and um, by site. And so with, for this um, graph, each site uh, had 30 scats that were investigated to see if there was evidence of penguin remains. And um, it shows here, this is the percent of scats that did have evidence of um, penguin remains. So 4% from Kangaroo Island, 10% from the York Peninsula, and 42% from the Flurio Peninsula. So this study shows that um, there is regional variation um, in the diet of long-nosed fur seals. Uh, the two taxa that contributed most to biomass um, on Kangaroo Island and York Peninsula haulouts were leather jackets and calamari. And um, if you looked at Flurio Peninsula, there was actually no evidence of leather jackets. So there are some quite big differences there. But regional differences in prey composition are likely to reflect um, the variation in the prey distribution. Um, Long-nosed fur seals are generalist predators. Um, but some of these variations may be representative of the different demographics at breeding sites versus haulouts. So um, when I sampled, the um, breeding colonies are predominantly made up of lactating females, whereas the haulouts are predominantly made up of subadult males and juveniles. And if, um, when comparing dietary composition, um, this feeding in oceanic waters doesn't really come as a surprise, as previous studies have shown us that adult females shift their foraging strategy from shelf waters to oceanic waters because they're highly nutrient and because their pups are larger at that time of year. So they're able to sustain um, longer fasting periods to allow those females to go on longer foraging trips. Whereas subadult males and um, juveniles don't have the constraints of dependent young. So they're expected to undergo shorter foraging trips in shelf waters where interactions with little penguins and commercially fished species are, um, are more likely to occur. In terms of um, commercially fish species, calamari and garfish represented 14% of um, reconstructed scat biomass. Initially looking at that, it was sort of like, oh, that's really different to you know, previous research. But once I, again, broke it down to breeding colonies and then compared that to um, previous studies and extracted their, the penguin biomass in, in those studies, um, that it was actually quite similar and quite consistent. In terms of haulouts, we don't actually have any other historical um, data at this stage to compare it to. Um, but there's ongoing research, so there's a, a big project funded by FRDC looking at the impacts of seal on, seals on, um, sea, on the seafood industry. And so um, tags are being deployed, looking at their foraging, looking at where they're going. And it's also important to note these ranges. So 43%, for example, that was evident at the Kingscoat site. So sites are feeding on different things, and then if there's a high proportion of one species, that can really um, drive the, the high occurrence of that um, species. 
So in terms of um, little penguins, I guess what's really interesting here is that the occurrence of um, little penguin colonies um, or abundance or availability of them doesn't necessarily correlate with um, what sites have the highest evidence of penguin predation. So in um, the Flurio Peninsula, for example, where there was 42% of scats with um, penguin remains, that's actually host to one of our smallest penguin colonies, um, Granite Island, which now only has about 11 penguins. Comparatively, if you look at Port Giles in the York Peninsula, there's only 10% of scats that had penguin remains, but um, it's only 12 kilometres away from one of our largest, breeding, uh, largest penguin colonies, Truebridge Island, which is estimated to have over 1,000 penguins in it. Um, so these higher predation levels in the Fleury Peninsula may be um, in response to reduced availability of other key prey species, but at this stage it's just unknown. So I guess the key point here is um, that how many penguins um, does this 42%, for example, in the Fleury Peninsula really represent? Um, it's 26 scats that had penguin remains, but does that represent five penguins? Does it represent 26 penguins? Um, this is sort of the big burning question um, that we're sort of struggling with. And um, so there are several limitations to the study. One of them is the low sample size, particularly when I'm um, doing spatial comparisons uh, with York Peninsula, for example, that had one site, whereas Kangaroo Island had eight. Um, there's also a lot of limitations associated with hard part analysis because you can only determine or identify species that have hard part diagnostic features. So the next steps forward are to use um, DNA analysis um, on SCATs, so that's currently all underway, and um, essentially exploring this in conjunction with hard parts to see what prey species come up and to compare them. And we're currently in the middle of a feeding trial with the captive fur seals at the Taronga Sioux, so we just had our seal Bondi eat his first salmon-stuffed penguin salmon, <laughs> and uh, we're very excited to sort of get an understanding of, of how long it does take them to digest um, penguin remains. So take-home messages are that there is regional prey composition variation for long-nosed fur seals, um, that leather jackets and calamari for the first time have sort of been described as key prey species. Um, the importance, I guess this study highlights the importance of investigating haul out sites to understand interactions with fisheries and penguins, and um, that feeding trials are currently underway. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, any questions for Sarah Lena, please? I might have missed it at the beginning, but how did you account for any seasonal differences in diet? So I didn't. Um, so for this, this study purely represents um, the winter season. So that, again, is definitely a very big limitation um, in this study. As um, yeah, previous research has shown big differences seasonally in terms of where animals are foraging. Um, and particularly in breeding colonies, you know, sort of more um, foraging in, in shelf waters. So that's something that um, would also be a really important avenue to explore. Did you typically find um, scats that had lots of penguin rem remains or did you find that there were a little bit in lots of scats? Because I would have thought that, you know, it's a pretty big meal, you would probably find that they tended to dominate. Was that right? Or? Yeah, so it was, a, it was a mixed bag, essentially. So, I mean, when I was out on Western Seal Island in the Fleury Peninsula, sometimes I was just like, feathers, feathers, that scat's got feathers. It was really obvious. I didn't even really need to do the sifting to determine that. Um, but then there were other scats where I would be going through it and go, oh, there's absolutely nothing in here. And then you know, there'd be five or six penguin feathers. Um, and so, yeah, it was really a combination of both. Um, so I did kind of go into this process of, oh, oh, should I start ranking it? You know, if it's 10 feathers, then it's this. If it's 100 feathers, it's this. Over 500, that's a whole individual. But it's really hard to have a succinct, accurate guideline for something like that. Okay, thanks very much, Sarah Lena. Next off is uh, Tony Flaherty. Oh, and a clap. 